Trace 2 bio, 16 September. Action. Okay. Come on, this is in the Okay. Is it gonna get out? Okay. I'll get out if you take one chance. He just said it. I'm not getting out. Okay. Alright. So I, I have to admit the following. I had a complete panic in the middle of the night about how far we got and how far we still got to get. So we're going really, really quickly from here on. There will be no time during lessons for homework. Okay, you just do homework. You know the word homework? Ooh. You do it at home. Okay, just say. Okay. So we were busy on shiny mask, nose. I'm giving up on this. I'm <laughs> starting to actually just stay at home from now on. Okay, all right. So, we were talking about factors, environmental resistance factors, that um, reduce the growth of populations. And we got onto this aspect, which is competition. Now, there are two different kinds of competition. So stop fiddling and look at me. Okay. There's competition between individuals of the same species. And that is called intraspecific competition. So if you guys in the nice, pretty red house swim against the guys in the nice, pretty red house, it's intraspecific competition because it's between individuals of the same group. And girls versus girls. Or if the competition is between individuals of different species, it is intra-specific competition. So when you're making pizza and you pick your pizza up and you put it towards your face and you open your mouth and a piece of cheese griller sausage falls off and you grab it halfway before your dog gets it, that's in specific competition because it's competition between you and your dog for the same limited resources. The cheese griller sausages on the, Ethan, no, on the pizza. Okay, right, everybody happy? In specific within the same species. In specific between different species. And you know that because you know that in house hockey is between different houses. Okay. Right, everybody happy with that? Okay, so interspecific is between competition, or it's competition between individuals of different species. Okay, so this is a classic experiment. It was done in the early 1930s by a particular scientist. He used this little organism called paramecium, which is a tiny little microscopic aquatic organism. And there are a number of different species of paramecium. And so what he did was he first of all took two separate containers, put nutrient medium in, put paramecium aurelia in one of them, and paramecium called datum in the other. So that's telling you it's in tourist specific competition because it's between we looking at individuals of this different species. And this is the population growth curves he got when he grew them separately. Okay? So when he grew them separately, Ethan, did I give you your notes ever? It's not my notes. No, I don't think you, I, th I think they're here, but don't worry, leave them. Because otherwise you're going to fiddle for the rest of the lesson and I'm going to crack and beat you to death. No, okay. Okay. So these are the growth curves that he got when he grew them separately. So what you can see is paramecium cordatum, in fact, even when grown separately with no competition, did not grow as well as paramecium aurelia. Then he put the same, or the two different species, in the same container. 
and over a period of 10 days, he counted the populations. Now what you can see is Paramecium aurelia actually grows, has exactly the same growth rate as it did when it was grown separately. But Paramecium cordatum does not work well when there is interspecific competition, because although the numbers initially rose, they peaked on day four and a half, three and a half, three and a half, okay, at a very low level. And then the numbers reduced until finally at day 10, there were actually only as many as there were on day naught. Okay. So Paramecium cordatum does not do well with interspecific competition when it is together with Paramecium aurelia. Okay, you happy with that? Okay, so independent variable in this investigation, really steady go, Erin. Uh, no. And you guys need to be very careful of this time thing. Okay, because I cannot tell you how many times kids fall for the trap of, or it's not an intentional trap, because it's on the x-axis, they think that time is an independent variable. And it's one of the few, time, few things where it'll be on the, independent, on the x-axis, but it's not the independent variable. So what they're doing here by putting in time is they're putting in a rate. So that's the the, 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 the yeah, so the, the, that's the rate is over t 10 days, so it is, it'll, it's a fixed variable. Sorry, babe. What is the, the, the two bacteria? The, the paramecium and the orion and the Yes, so it's um, whether they were grown separately or whether they were grown together. Okay, it's an independent variable. And Therefore, population growth rate is actually the dependent variable. So just be so careful when you get any graph that has time there. And I can remember a year when in the matric prac exam, the same exam as the matrics wrote today, there was a huge misunderstanding where the examiner had put time as the independent variable and it wasn't the independent variable. It was, that was also, time was an aspect of rate. And it caused quite a big hoo-ha. Yep, ma'am, what? Be ma'am. I was going to say, wouldn't it be amount of resources? Would be what? Your independent, available? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. So that's a limiting factor. No, so, yeah, it, that's a limiting factor, and it would be a fixed variable. Okay. Because, so yeah, it's not the thing you're changing. You start at the beginning with the uh, same well, quantity of resources. Yeah, it is what would happen if you put them together, but you don't vary the quantity of resources. The quantity of resources is going to become the limiting factor. So you would choose to put them together, not together. Yes. Okay, happy, happy, guys. All right. Everybody happy with that? So, in tourist specific competition, you're okay with that? Here's your homework. Ready, steady, go. Please take note of the word homework. Shaneke, do you have a sibling in grade 12? No. No. My sister's out. Did you think was oh, you said something the other day that made me think there was. Oh. Okay, right, can I go? Okay, all right. You have to know certain South African examples of interspecific specific competition, and they're quite logical. Okay, so a hyena and a lion competing over the same resources. Okay, or a hyena and a leopard, or a leopard and a lion, or whatever, whatever. Okay. I need to point this out to you so that you don't go pear-shaped. All right. Please remember your textbook is written for the government education department system, and their syllabus is slightly different to that of the IEB. 
And there are certain sections <coughs> in this particular section in your textbook that you must ignore. Well, you don't have to. I'm fine if you learn it. You're just wasting your life. Okay. So they include a section called symbiosis that runs from page 292 to 295. You don't do it. Okay. There are also, also some additional parts that are in the IEP syllabus, not in the government education department syllabus. So this is the other way around. And take care that you learn from the notes and that you keep checking the SAGs. Don't learn this section from the textbook. Okay. I don't know anyone in the textbook, but I use notes in the Okay, all right, so I just need to quickly go through this word niche. So this word has changed in meaning over time. Okay, niche used to refer to where does the animal live? It was um, more like habitat, only habitat. And now it means the role <coughs> of an organism in that community. People were bored with the old meaning. <laughs> no, I have no idea. Hey, you don't have to learn different meanings. I had to. I have to relearn it. Okay, so it includes um, the type of food that it eats, where it lives, the predators that eat it, or the food that it eats, and its relationship with other species. Okay, so for example, if you're talking about a hippopotamus. Um, part of its whole niche role is that um, it can get territorial and prevent animals coming to the water holes to drink. Okay, it's an example. Um, okay, yes, listening. Niche also be, I think I read about somewhere that a zebra, the ze I can't remember what it was, I think it was a zebra eats the grass first and then the wildebeest come and eat the soft bit underneath what the zebra eats. So that, that's like a symbiotic relationship. <laughs> It's a mutualistic, it's a... I can't remember that. I just remember um, I'll think about it. No, because they don't both benefit. Yeah. yeah. No, the zebra doesn't... The zebra yeah, doesn't so it's a... This one benefits that. Commensalistic. Yes. Ma'am, mm. what's the point of dung beetles rolling down balls? Because they lay their babies, they lay their eggs in them. Mm. I've always wondered why they carry those, like, ball of No, so they... they not all of them do, but the ones that roll, they lay their eggs and then they bury the it ball. the ball. And when the larva hatches, it eats the duck. Oh, so, so if you go and like, kick one, then you're like kicking its like children. Correct. <laughs> no, no, oh my gosh, no. So like when we were little, man, we'd always see these like, like if we would go like, like so far and we'd always see these little guys like rolling the balls and like, oh wow, it looks like this obnoxious little As opposed to kicking babies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know I'm killing millions of little children. Yeah, and so dung beetles are amazing. They are. They are. Do you know that NASA? Do you know what NASA is? NASA. Yes. Yes. So NASA yes. yes. So yeah, I didn't know there was another NASA. NASA <laughs> is um, using South African scientists from Wits University to find things about um, how dung beetles can navigate when, first of all, they navigate by sun. Secondly, they navigate by the Milky Way. What? And so that the South African scientists have done amazing experiments in the planetarium at Wits. They put big, um, round, planky things on the seats and they rotate them and they change what's showing in the sky in the planetarium. And then the little dung beetles go in different directions depending on what the Milky Way, where the Milky Way is about them. But now, one step further, they've discovered that even on completely dark nights, when the Milky Way is not visible, that they can still navigate. 
So now they, NASA is paying South African guys to do research to try and work out how they are navigating with no sun, well, no Milky Way, etc. Just have a sense of memory and know where they left off before it got like really, really like cloudy and dark. Like, what's it just like, like memorize? Like, yes, we were going this way, now we were this way. I know the and answer. I was like, no. You know the answer. Give me the yes, answer. Yes, they're following the smell of the poop, the trail of poop they made behind them. No, because they didn't have poop with them before. Oh. I know, this is a joke. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a good hypothesis. But if they're just taking, because they always travel in straight lines, because other dung beetles steal their ball. Maybe they have like, someone at home that has like a pheromone that they can follow. Ma'am, let's go to the pheromone. Okay, moving on. Yes, Emily. But what allows them to do that? Uh, uh, in their brain. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a brain that's the size of a rice grain. The size of but they can <laughs> they can navigate better than we can. <laughs> it's just amazing. Anyway, moving on. Sorry. Don't be so one of my things. Okay, moving. <laughs> okay. Anyway, moving on. Okay. And therefore, because species um, compete with each other for the same resources, they quite often do something called resource partitioning. And that's what Jesse was talking about. Where if there is a limited supply of something, then different species use different parts of that thing that is limited, whatever that factor is that is limited. Okay, so do you remember your old nursery rhymes and Jack Spratt? Well, this explains a whole lot of why you kids are so limited. <laughs> Jesse, put your mask over your nose. Okay, right, as a new blesser. Okay, so they know. <laughs> I was not being nasty to you. I was saying, you're not limited. Okay, so they do something called resource partitioning. Okay, so species coexist in ecosystems if they can share resources, which are in limited supply. And to avoid one species dying out completely, coexisting species partition or divide certain resources or even specialize to different modes of life so that one species doesn't outcompete another. Because everything's got a place. Everything's got a niche. Everything's got a role. And this is called resource partitioning. And it minimizes competition between similar species. So it's defined as when two species partition or divide a resource based on either behavioral or morphological. Morphology means structure variation and it is termed resource partitioning or differential resource utilization and this is a good example it's stratification in the forest so certain plants require a very high light intensity some require medium light intensity some require a very low light intensity those trees in a forest which require a very high light intensity actually will stick out above all the other trees and they're called the overstory. And they're quite light green. They don't have as much chlorophyll as the other ones. So you're gonna find as you go down, more and more chlorophyll in the leaves. Okay, the very short little things down here, the little Mrs. Pages, have all got lots of chlorophyll. Okay, bigger leaves, see that's why I've gotta be wide and more chlorophyll. Okay, so it's an overstory, a canopy, an understory, shrub layer, and then the little plants on the forest floor. And so these ones require the highest light intensity or else they don't survive. These ones flourish in low light intensity, but they've got adaptations which enable them to live in an area of low light intensity. Then you've got things like orchids. Certain orchids, now you know that orchids are quite tiny plants. Certain orchids require quite a high light intensity to survive, but they're small plants. So they won't 
live down here and they need this nice humid environment. So what they do is they are epiphytes. They will live on the branches of trees. They're not parasites. The only thing that they're benefiting from the actual tree is that they're growing high up and are able to get uh, quite a lot of light. But they, they don't parasitize the tree. They don't absorb nutrients or water or anything from the tree. They're just getting support up there. Okay, yep. Um, I know that some plants and trees are made in specific ways that the bottom can be still as well as light. Yes. Like a pine tree, are they like that? So they don't go into the earth and they don't stop them? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very amazing. And also the arrangement of the leaves. Yeah. But if it's... So many plants have got their leaves arranged sort of spirally, so that they're not shading the ones below. But in an area where it's very hot and dry, they are arranged differently so that they do shade the ones below, just to prevent excess water loss. And so here we've got Jessicans. Okay, so this is exactly what Jess is talking about. You often get wildebeest and zebra living in the same environment. And the benefit of these, well, other than the fact that they, the greater the number, the less chance there is of any one individual being killed. And the zebras here and the wildebeest here, the other way around, one of them yeah. the, the zebra, it's basically that the zebra eat the, they, so they've got different digestive systems. The wildebeest, are ruminants and the zebras, if I remember correctly, are hind gut fermenters. I think these are ruminants. And so these ones are able to digest very coarse grass. So they eat, the zebra eat the top layers of grass, which is very coarse. And by doing that, they open the bottom layers up for the wildebeest that can't digest the coarse layer at the top. So then the wildebeest are able to eat the softer, more easily digestible layers towards the bottom. Okay, so resource partitioning. Okay, you happy with that? All right, then you've got coexisting predators. So leopards have adapted to live alongside other predators, for example, lion, either by hunting for different kinds of prey than the lions hunt for, by avoiding contact with them, hunting at different times of the day, or avoiding the areas frequented by them. So you don't often see lion hunting in areas where there are quite a lot of trees, whereas leopards do quite often hunt where there are lots of trees because they hoist their kill. So leopards are actually not very strong individuals, and hyenas can very often steal kill from leopards. So the leopards will put in all the work and expend all the energy and kill something and the next thing a hyena whips in and grabs it and runs. And the leopard generally can't do anything, especially if it's more than one hyena. And that's why leopards will, one of the reasons why leopards hoist their kills up in trees so that the hyenas can't get them. Okay, all right, you can have a look at that at some stage of the game. Okay, so we're now going to talk about intraspecific competition. So this is between individuals of the same species. Okay. And therefore, they would compete for food, for space, for reproductive partners, and for other resources. And quite often, it results in what is known as territoriality or hierarchical behavior or pecking order. Do you guys know what a pecking order is? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk first of all about territoriality. So basically it goes when birds sing, they're not singing because they're happy. They're singing because they're marking their territory. So you know when you take your dog out for a walk and it lifts its leg on every tree and every pole? Okay, it's marking territory. Birds mark territory by singing. So especially a male bird will go and sit in the middle of his territory and do a little bit of singing and he, 
indicating to other male birds, this is my territory and the females in this territory are my females. I'm mating with them. I think for birds, it's more of a like, scream, <laughs> like just screaming at other ones. Because like... Do you only have Indian miners at home? No, because... No, no they... Oh, no. You obviously don't have robins and yeah, bulbuls. I'll say uh, 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 you're lucky, I'll start at three. I'm an owl on my roof, so every time I fly the clock in the morning, I have so roosters. Yeah, yeah, we have roosters. Next one. Right outside. Oh, yeah. Okay, right, moving on, because we do want to finish this year. Okay. So, this is indicating a territory, and you know that different animals indicate territory in different ways. Hyenas do it by anal pasting, etc., by um, a little liquid from the glands inside the anus. This is an animal called a torpy, and it lives, those of you who are watching wild, Wild Earth Life. Hmm? <laughs> it wasn't like just standing there like this. Is Isn't that a wild <laughs> No, no, it's a toppy and it's on a termite mound. Mm -hmm. And it's going, this is my territory. Therefore, all the females in this area are mine. I am going to mate with all of them. So, guys, it's exactly the same. Who doesn't know what impalas do in the rut? In the Right. Okay, go. Right, so it goes like this. So let's say here's a whole game reserve. Okay? And there are lots of male and pollen, there are lots of female and pollen, and for most of the year they get on fine. Come the mating season, or just before the mating season, the male's testosterone levels, that's the male hormone, rises significantly and they get all like grade 8 boys. <laughs> so what they do is they undergo a process called a rut where they get quite aggressive to each other and they put their heads against each other and they bash against each other and they push each other until eventually one will acknowledge that it's not as strong as the other. So they're doing it amongst all the males and so what eventually happens is there will be the dominant male of the whole reserve, the strongest male. He has the biggest territory, and he's got all the females in that territory belong to him, and he mates with all of them. The next strongest male has a little smaller territory, doesn't have as many females, etc., etc., until you get the little sad bachelor boys. No nookie what? for these boys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, so these little bachelor birds, they don't get any females. And the only way that they are able to survive is by they can live in another male's territory, but they cannot challenge the other.